Ele tinha pouco mais de 20 anos quando decidiu, na garagem de casa, concentrar em uma só placa de circuito todos os componentes que formavam os poderosos e caros computadores da época, os chamados mainframes, que ocupavam andares inteiros nas poucas companhias que tinham dinheiro para pagar por eles. Junto com um amigo, ele fundou uma empresa que revolucionou a forma como conhecemos e usamos os computadores e continua revolucionando. O nome desse amigo, Steve Jobs. A empresa, a Apple. Ele é Steve Wozniak, o Voz. O Espaço Aberto Ciência e Tecnologia de hoje traz uma entrevista com um dos geeks mais famosos e queridos do planeta que esteve em São Paulo para participar da Campus Party. O nosso programa está começando. Eu sou Steve Wozniak, eu co-founded Apple Computer. Se eu puder aplicar o mesmo gênio para dançar com as estrelas, eu acho que eu posso fazer bem nessa competição. Ele cresceu estimulado pelo pai engenheiro projetista de foguetes. Aos 11 anos, era um dos mais jovens radioamadores do mundo. E dois anos depois, mostrou em uma feira de ciências uma máquina capaz de somar e subtrair. Foi com este espírito aguçado que, no início da década de 70, o jovem Steve Wozniak se uniu ao colega de faculdade Steve Jobs. A parceria dos Steves gerou frutos que revolucionaram a história. Em 76, eles apresentavam ao mundo o primeiro computador pessoal. O Apple I era pouco mais que uma placa com os circuitos integrados, mas podia ser ligado a um teclado e a um monitor de TV, um avanço que mudaria o universo da tecnologia em uma época dominada por grandes computadores. Pois o prodígio Woz esteve no Brasil para participar da Campus Party e conversou com o Espaço Aberto Ciência e Tecnologia. Woz, no Brasil, Bruno! Woz, uh, first of all, what uh, has driven you when you invented the desktop computer? I was driven by early goals in my life, a lot of which have, things happened by accident, that drove me to love in my heart was I was going to own a computer of my own someday. I would give up a house. I would not even own a house if I could have that computer. And so it just took a while as the prices of parts came down and down and down. Eventually, I spotted the formula to have my own computer that was useful and could do the work I wanted to do and could play games. So it was something that you worked to make your personal life easier, more uh, comfortable, and there was nothing related to a business project. It wasn't so much like it had a positive outcome. It wasn't something you could say, here is why I did it. I just wanted to my whole life. Now, once I had the computer, I knew how to use it to do my work at Hewlett Packard, where I was an engineer. And I also liked to type in games, solve puzzles, do the sorts of things programmers can do. Finally, if you're a programmer, if you know how to program, and you have a machine that you can write programs in, for the rest of your life, the number of programs you can write is infinite. And what do you believe from uh, your experience that it's still possible for young people to invent uh, revolutionary hardware nowadays, such uh, difficult times, or it's uh, really impossible, which means that uh, revolutionary hardware, yeah. they need well, huge amounts of investments nowadays. Most hardware has undergone incredible changes in our lifetime due to the cost of making little chips coming down and down and down and everything that used to cost a million dollars is on one chip that costs 25 cents. So it's, it's more difficult to implement new things that have a big impact in life that are hardware in that electronic arena, in the computer arena. But software is still open. I mean, we just read 10 billion apps have been downloaded for the iPhone. A number of people can get out there and write apps for phones and programs for computers and, and automate their company's processes and all this and, and run network, network apparatus things and set up web pages for others. It's just unbelievably um, expanded. So you, you really believe it's a matter of using your hand? People have a certain amount of creative desire to create things built into them. And a certain number of us want to create new things. We just want to play and find out new ways to make things better. And that number of people doesn't go down. It's just that how it comes out is maybe limited and channeled by the environment of the day. In today's environment, a lot of the creativity comes out in places like Facebook. I'm going to set up my appearance, how I look to the rest of the world, which videos I chose to show, and which songs I say that I'm interested in. So the people that put a lot of time, that it means a lot to them, 
are very, very creative in that sense. Um, and even the game players. We all know that game playing gets, develops your mind for strategies in life. What is the key element for a successful business in our days? I mean, making a massive investment in technology or in people. What would your choice be? It's, that's a very difficult question to answer because words technology and people have many, many different layers of meaning. If you're going to start a company and you want your company to be successful, that usually means it's going to make money. But to a lot of us, a lot of us who are young and pioneers and creating the new stuff, we just want to change the world and we don't care how much money the company's in. We want to be known for having made a successful company that kind of goes on, changes things in a way that continues. And the trouble is to have a successful company, you better have good people. The other people are the people who are going to use your product. I think you should put all the effort into understanding those people that are going to use your product, program it, build the hardware in ways that naturally come to human beings. The human must be more important than the technology. And most people would agree with that statement, and yet very, very few products, very few companies seem to follow that philosophy. Em 1981, em pleno sucesso da Apple, Woz caiu pilotando seu avião e tratou a amnésia causada pelo acidente com muito videogame. Hey, Steve, are you just getting here? In 81, almost 30 years ago, you had a plane accident, you lost your memory, and after that shock, you decided to go back to university and leave Apple. Was that the most difficult period of your life, and uh, in <laughs> what way it has changed you, the way you are? It was not a difficult period of my life, and first of all, I have set myself up with philosophy since I was 20 years old, in inborn ways that I do things in life that I'm not going to have grief and bad periods in life. Nothing could ever give me a bad period in life that would give normal people bad periods, or it would take an awful lot. I had already thought, you know, gosh, Apple is now large, it's got lots of different engineers and different capacities, and even if I weren't here, Apple can go on successfully. I had done my part. So when I came out of amnesia after five weeks, I just picked up the phone, called Steve Jobs, and I said, I'm going to go back and get my degree because this is my last chance. And it really was. Ten years later, it's the last chance to finish college. Daqui a pouco, os erros, os desafios atuais e os sonhos para o futuro. Depois de deixar para trás as tarefas como executivo da Apple, Woz decidiu terminar a faculdade. Deu aulas no ensino médio, criou empresas e um campeonato mundial de polo em Segway, aquela espécie de andador sobre duas rodas. Steve Wozniak and his partner, Karina Smirnoff. Sempre extrovertido, Steve Woz é seguido por uma legião de fãs que o acompanham desde a versão americana da Dança dos Famosos. Até o seriado The Big Bang Theory. Is that Steve Woz? I think it is. The great and powerful Woz. Woz, the world has seen you in TV commercials, TV popular series, Dancing with the Stars. What could you tell us about your pop star lifestyle? I mean, uh, is that the real Wozniak trying to make the most fun of life? A lot of these things are blessed accidents. Never once would I ever pick up a phone and call a press, even yourself, and say, I want you to print something. Never once would I call a TV show and say, I want to be on your show. Never, ever. I try to hide back and be, my natural style is to be unseen. But they call me, and I answer the phone, and I'm polite, and I, I get talked into things. And I turn down Dancing with the Stars so many times because I can't dance. I've never seen the show. And, but they talk you into it if they're nice enough. So I am blessed, and it is kind of a rock star life everywhere I go. But I had that before these TV shows. Even before the TV shows, anywhere in the world, people might come up, oh my gosh, Apple is such a great company. Or, you know, oh God, I love my Apple II computer. Is it all the racing championship? Yeah. Oh, what is it about the Z car? It is awesome. Hey, Steve, you sell the apples. I'll sell the Z. 
So I already had that. I don't know why an engineer would ever get it. I think they admired a lot of things that they know about my life. You know, the fact that I would go back and get a degree, the fact that I would teach young kids for eight years, you know, and keep it secret, the fact that I was very charitable and didn't really do things for money. And uh, what would you say it's your ph philosophy nowadays? Yeah. Um, well, major philosophy is life's about happiness. You measure your accomplishment by that, not by um, money. Be nice to people. An individual letting somebody know that you care about their situation is more important than even creating a personal computer for the world. Um, when, it, when a teacher looked at me and said, oh, wow, you know, you did great work and praised me, that sort of praise, that meant more in my life and th that what I was doing was good stuff and I'm going to keep it up and keep going at it than, than uh, and, you know, anything that comes from it that you can really measure in other ways. So it really gets down to, to me, the philosophy is feel good in your heart. That's where the happiness has to be. In your biography, you say you learned not to give uh, great credibility to what you read in the media. Uh, how to believe in what we see and in what we read in the internet? Do you think there should have to be any kind of control of quality? I don't like the idea of controls, but I think there always has to be some. Let's call it regulation, if you will. Where do our freedoms come from? In the United States, our freedoms come from regulation. It's called the Bill of Rights and the Constitution. And it says, basically, life will be run on these sort of rules. These are what Congress cannot do to impede things. But there's always limits. I mean, we have freedom of speech, but you can't yell fire in, the, in a crowded theater, and you can't stimulate people to go to violence. There are still limits to free speech. I think that there should be stronger penalties when the media prints fabricated information and very incorrect information about individuals, and they know that it is. Take very negative slants, and they'll say, oh, by technical reading of the words, a lawyer can pre demonstrate that this is clearly by a spreadsheet okay and true, but it's really given everybody an impression that's a lie. Was well, you are co-founder of uh, EFF, which is one of the most important uh, nets and ships uh, organizations. What are the biggest challenges for the internet now and uh, in the future? There are a lot of individual challenges on the internet and usually it runs into the gamut of either um, the government or large companies trying to manipulate and regulate what users will get and see in their internet experience. And I'm for just, it should be totally open, it should be as free. When we first discovered the internet, it was, oh my God, I can get to anywhere in the world for the first time in my life at basically no cost. And I can just, I can actually share information with other people far away. I can put up my own websites. And now we're getting told that maybe people who pay money will be able to get their television channels to me a little bit faster than somebody who didn't want to pay the money. Let me choose. Let me say, I want all these TV shows. And great, if, if I can only see one at a time, let me choose. You know, which one gets the preference. Um, no, the internet neutrality it's called, but it goes deeper than net neutrality. And basically, I am on the internet and you don't get in the way, you don't blockade, you don't, you don't focus and become a content provider and decide what I'm going to get to on the internet. Are you a big fan of uh, convenience in terms of uh, technology on the market? And uh, if so, would you say convenience is the key element of Apple's success? Apple got a reputation for making easier to use products than other people that were sort of more understandable to a human with eyes and fingers um, over time. And to this day, Apple's really setting the tone for that, changing all of our, a lot of our cell phone experience and now the pad experience and by presenting it in ways that are basically more convenient. Look, we care about quality. And all, our, all my life, music, you got hi-fi, you bought hi-fi systems. The higher the fidelity, the more the fidelity from the low frequencies to the highs, they were all reproduced equally. And then all of a sudden, MP3s came along, and quality was out the door. We didn't care about quality, we cared about the convenience. And that's what the modern computer era, the internet era is all about. It's how easy and quick can I just get something by almost no action at all. Uh, was Steve Jobs, the guy who did the iPhone, the iPod, the iPad, would that uh, products have happened without him? Those products were already happening without Steve Jobs. There were a lot of music players, MP3 music players. Very low amount of songs on expensive media compared to today, or the mini disc from Sony where you had to record your own. And Apple really got the formula right. So really what Steve's contribution is, 
is spotty when the formula is right for the masses. And he very often says, not for the techies who understand everything, but for everybody to use the same as a Walkman. How do you make a device? And there was the iPod. So Steve was very, very responsible for that. Would it have happened without him? Well, Apple has kind of a good culture, but I think back in the, that, those days, Steve was certainly the most important person to guarantee. You know, if you, if you have a normal company, there might be 10 important executives, each vying to have certain features on something. It'll come out cluttered with features. We don't do that. That whole idea of simplicity and convenience is it does what I want and not much more. And that's, that's a balance that Apple's very good at finding. And talking about Steve Jobs' health, uh, do you think that, I mean, for whatever reason, if uh, Steve Jobs would not be at Apple, would the company be as capable as able to produce the kind of products it's producing? Oh, the analysts uh, talk about this over and over and over. And the last time Steve had a health problem, they made it sound like they, they kind of all agreed that Apple would not be the same. Steve's gone. Apple goes down the drain. And this time, the same analysts are saying, oh, Apple has a good seated um, you know, set of you know, top executives and staff and it will really go on the same for some time. So who knows what you want to believe. Well, so what is the most important technology product you use in your daily life and why? The most important is my MacBook Pro, which is kind of like the older, larger um, laptop, because that's the one that I usually prefer to sit down with at home or in hotel rooms, which is most of my life, and start doing my internet work, which is hours a day, and it's very important to me. When I'm, when I'm in a place like, like a restaurant or an airplane, I prefer the iPad, and I use the iPad for the same things. And when I'm walking around, I don't have, and all I have on me is my iPhone, my iPhone is great too. So each, each three equally. And what was your biggest business or technology mistake in your life? Yikes. Um, <laughs> at Apple, I didn't make, really make many mistakes. And looking back, I said, well, I could have done a couple things differently that would have really actually helped Apple. But um, I've started other companies since then. And I think well, one, one recently was called Wheels of Zeus, and we were going to make a little GPS-based telecommunications device that you could put on a dog not have to charge it for a year, and not have to charge it for a year, and it would always tell you if your dog accidentally escaped its boundaries, went where it wasn't supposed to, or you could put it in a car, or you could put it in your briefcase, and you would always be able to find these things, and it turns out that it just, I wasn't able to accomplish it. Um, technically, it couldn't make it small enough, cheap enough, long enough um, on the, running on the battery. So it's something that you... So, so it's technically, technically, it was um, unable to achieve the first goal. We took it into different other markets, but... And is there anything that uh, you still dream about inventing or that yeah. you, you, you wish you had done it? Yes, for um, sometimes your long-time dreams, eventually in life, you hit, you become very associated with it. And one of those is um, photonics, where the photonics are doing all the logic in a computer. Basically, instead of feeding a battery into a chip, you feed in a light stream, and da -da -da, everything's being done with light, and light stream, a little fiber optic comes out, and, and there's no electrons involved. And that's, um, there have been a lot of experiments close to it, but it's not a, a, a viable technology yet. I'm also thinking that might apply to a new form of memory. The, the memory that we make the most of these days is not what you call memory in your computer, not RAM in your computer. It's the NAND flash chips, the type that you put into cameras. They're now popping up in what's called solid state disks that make your computer a little faster. I'm working for a company, Fusion IO, that has the best formula of all. Put a bunch of them on a board, plug it right into the servers, hundreds of thousands of servers for all the big companies in the world, plug them right into the server and get rid of hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of equipment sitting there in racks, you know, because it's so fast it's not needed. And I'm thinking, these, one thing is, this is a speed, RAM is, RAM is fast. This NAND flash, the storage that we're replacing hard disk with, is slower. Hard disks are much slower yet to get access to. Well, I'm thinking, where can you get a, a type of storage that lasts forever with no power at all, just like your camera, just like your camera cards, but it's as fast as the RAM in our computers? And uh, there are new technologies trying to get there, and they each have problems. And sometimes the problems are because they're trying to push electrons through through um, other through crystal structures, or they're trying to push oxygen atoms through. Those things are big and heavy. What if you were pushing photons? What if you could store photons? So I'm hoping that some, some technology 
gets found by someone someday that photons are being stored in the chip, and you'll now have a chip that's so much smaller, so much faster, and zero power. You think it's going to happen? I think it's going to happen. I, I, I mean, I'm sure looking for any clues I can ever find to be a part of it. <laughs> and was how, how, how do you feel being uh, an idol for, I mean, thousands and thousands, millions of uh, geeks all over the world? I mean, you are here in Brazil. It's your second time here. And, uh, and from, from what I, I feel, I mean, people love you. I mean, how, how, how do you feel about it? I mean, um, I don't know. You know what? You are who you are. You can't really change who you are. You can't change your personality very much. And um, people just like the things that I've stood up for and spoken out for. And I've remained very much a person, uh, a populist person. I'm for the consumer and not the big, wealthy, powerful companies and, and governments and manipulators. Yeah. I'm always for people's freedom and how people feel about each other. Yeah. And I think it comes across. And, I, you know, they, I don't know, they also like the fact that I, I d d was involved in some very important technology steps, sort of the seed that has grown to this huge thing we have nowadays. What could you say about our country, Brazil? Brazil is now very famous all over the world. I mean, the economy is doing very, very well. But we still have to invest a lot in education. What do you think about it? I don't think education will ever get enough investment in any country of the world because the money tends to come from government and government allocates money according to votes and children don't get the vote. The people who are going to be the students in schools don't get to vote for schools. And so they're always going to be squeezed out by the people that a family of five gets no more votes than a family of two. And I'm for education. I've been for two things my whole life, technology and education. So I care a lot about this, and I do everything I can to help education. I think we need a lot of, lot of voluntary effort and a lot of effort from parents to contribute. And the really good, smart students, the ones that go far in life, generally come out of an environment where they get a lot more than just going to school and watch my kid for the day. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. good, my pleasure. Great pleasure speaking to you. Okay. Thank you so much. Obrigado. O Espaço Aberto Ciência e Tecnologia fica por aqui. Mas continua na internet. Visite o nosso site e faça o programa conosco, deixando seus comentários e as suas sugestões. O endereço é g1.com.br/globonews. Até a semana que vem.